Among the many pictures of the Christian life in the scripture is that of a race. Not a sprint, but a marathon. And the reason why the biblical writers use the language of a marathon as opposed to a dash or a sprint is because the Christian life is a race not of speed, but of endurance. The Christian race is a lifetime of holding on, of not giving up, of pressing on towards Christ. And often along the way, the people of God feel real discouragement. Just like every long race, every marathon, there's a point where the runners contemplate giving up. Perhaps... In your Christian race this morning, this is how you feel. You feel weary and exhausted. You feel like you are losing heart. And if that's you this morning, if you're weary and exhausted and losing heart, if you're feeling discouraged and defeated in your walk with God, Paul has a word for you. And in our text this morning, we will find a balm to our sore hearts and a rest for our weariness. You have your Bibles open to Galatians 6. Follow along with me in your copy of Scripture as I read this text. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. Let's pray, and then we will look at this text this morning. Father, as we approach your word this morning, we need your help. I am sure there are many here who are feeling profoundly weighed down this morning, profoundly discouraged. They're tired of doing what's right, tired of doing good. And so, Father, as we look at this encouragement from your word, I ask that you would lift up these tired hearts, that you in grace would give us all strength and give us resolution to continue on. Keep the messenger out of the way of the message. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, our focus in Galatians 6 has been on the life of the church. This is what Paul is dealing with as he's wrapping up this letter. His discussion of church life has included the confrontation of sin, the bearing of burdens, providing for pastors, and the reality that what we sow is what we will reap. What we do in our private lives, for good and for bad, will manifest in the life of the church. And that's where we ended last time in our study of Galatians. And here this morning, we're picking up in verse 9 with Paul's encouragement for exhausted Christians. Paul admonishes us not to give up, not to give in, not to lose heart. So let's begin where Paul does, and that's with this idea of growing weary or of exhaustion. Look at the first part of verse 9. Paul writes, Let us not grow weary of well-doing. This word, grow weary, is one word in the Greek, in kakeo, which means to lose enthusiasm, be discouraged, or be afraid. You could translate this as the Legacy Standard Bible does, let us not lose heart in doing good. That's the idea. It's this idea of losing your passion, losing your enthusiasm, being discouraged, losing heart. Paul says, let us not lose heart. Let us not grow weary in doing good. Well, what could Paul possibly mean by this phrase of good? What does he have in mind? Some commentators suggest that doing good is specifically in reference to money, meeting the physical needs and provision for others. And while that's certainly part of what it means to be doing good, that's not all that doing good means. Doing good, in fact, is far broader than that. Doing good is simply doing good. 
It is moral goodness. It's living in obedience to God and his word. It is practical goodness, living out the Christian life, specifically loving our neighbors, loving our church family, doing good works. And in fact, in other places in scripture, that language of good works is parallel to here in Galatians 6, where Paul says good things. They are the same thing. And because we believe that context is the most important element in interpreting the Bible, we get an idea of just how broad doing good is in Paul's mind. Here in chapter 6, we've seen three paramount ways, three big ways that we can do good. In Galatians 6, 1, Paul says, expresses the doing good in the sense of restoring sinning Christians. Verse 1 of chapter 6, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a, spiritual, in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So that's one way of doing good. Another way of doing good is what he says in the next verse, in verse 2, of bearing one another's burdens, where he writes, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We do good by providing for our pastors. Verse 6, let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. So here in Galatians 6, we have three different ways that we are instructed to do good. Three categories of doing good. Restoring sinning Christians, bearing one another's burdens, and providing for pastors. And so we have to ask ourselves then, why does Paul say, do not grow weary in doing good? Don't lose heart in your good works. Why does he have to say that? Well, the reason is this. Doing good is frankly exhausting. Just think about those three categories in those verses that we just cited. There's more specifics in Galatians. There's more in the entirety of Scripture. But just for this morning, just think about those three. It is an exhausting thing to love our fellow Christians enough to confront sin in their lives and to seek their restoration. Most Christians are so intimidated by the idea of confronting visible sin in the life of their fellow Christians that they ignore it altogether. Most churches shirk their responsibility to discipline their own members. In fact, it's become popular in modern Christianity to dismiss entirely the expectation of a Christian formally joining a church and pledging to be committed to that church. It's a tiring thing, not only to confront sin in another's life, but to keep watch on our own lives, to keep watch on our own selves. The fight against sin is a fight to the death, and it is hard work to work at mortifying our flesh. It's an exhausting thing to bear one another's burdens, isn't it? We all talk about and love the idea of being there for others. But those portraits of grandeur fade when our brothers and sisters' needs inconvenience us. We're sure here for each other on Sunday morning where being here means that we say hi and sing a song. But if you and I want to have real community, if we want to be the kind of church that the New Testament lays out for us, then we will be a church where we are bearing one another's burdens. And that means that we have to be actually involved in each other's lives. That means we actually have to know what's going on in our brother's and sister's life. That means that you and I have to take that step of sharing our burdens with our brothers and sisters. That means that we have to, as the book of James says, we have to be confessing our sins to one another. This means that you take that phone call at 2 a.m. and you put on a pot of coffee so your brother or sister, your church family, can come over and sit at your dining room table and just weep. And that kind of Christianity is exhausting. 
which is why I think most of us have never actually experienced that kind of Christianity. Because most Christians, I think it's fair to assume, don't actually live like we're supposed to. But if we did hypothetically live that way, you would start to really feel weary. And that's especially the case if you pour your life and time and money into others and you end up just getting used and there is no long-term change in that person whatsoever, that will drain you. It's exhausting to provide for your pastor. You work hard. Money is not easy to come by. But as we saw when we looked at Galatians 6.6, 6, we are responsible to financially support the teaching pastor of the church. That's the Bible's clear teaching. And when you're struggling and the bills are competing for your dollar, it's a stressful thing to give in faith. And stress, especially financial stress, will make you weary. Many marriages end over this very issue of financial stress. So those are just three ways of doing good that are present for us here in Galatians 6. Restoring sinning Christians, bearing one another's burdens, providing for pastors. We could broaden that study to every good work that we're called to as Christians, but we don't have time this morning to do that. We just have time to just consider these ways that God expects us to be doing good. It's a tiring thing. Doing good is a life that could lead to profound weariness and to profound exhaustion. In a study released late last year by the Hartford Institute for Religion Research, more than 40% of clergy have seriously considered leaving their congregations in the past four years. A tenth of them regularly think about leaving. One pastor quoted in the report said this, I am exhausted. People have moved away from the area and new folks are fewer and farther and slower to engage. Our regular volunteers are tired and overwhelmed. Exhausted, tired, overwhelmed. This is where many pastors are at right now. And this is where many Christians are at right now. Doing good is a draining thing. And doing good is especially difficult when those who do wrong do so well in this world. Solomon expressed his dismay at this reality in Ecclesiastes 7.5, where he said, In my vain life, I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. The psalmist Asaph is especially raw in his articulation of this truth in Psalm 73, verse 1 through 14. Listen as I read along. This is, this is a, a, an inspired writer of scripture lamenting the fact that the righteous suffer while the wicked prosper. Listen to, listen to Asaph's cry here. He says, Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches, 
All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long, I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. Does that resonate with you? That those who are in opposition to God are at the top. And those who are trying to live their Christian life, trying to live as servants of God, are at the bottom. Those who are wicked are, are prospering and they're rich. And they, it seems like, don't have a care in the world. But it, God's people are the ones who suffer. God's people are asking God, don't, don't you know, don't you see that these wicked triumph while we suffer? Not long ago, just in the recent weeks, uh, a couple, a young couple, missionaries, they were, they were executed and burned alive. Well, burned, burned up. Uh, while dad is on the cell phone listening to the horror of it all. And you say, what is that? That's what we're talking about. It is doing good, and in the doing good, feeling absolutely drained and defeated, feeling absolutely discouraged. Asaph felt that way. He said, all day long, I am stricken. When I wake up in the morning, I am rebuked. For all of our doing good, it often feels like it's for no lasting good at all. We love and work and what do we get for it? But rejection and exhaustion. And like Asaph, it feels like our feet are slipping out from us. We become so discouraged. And part of the reason why I think that we become discouraged is because our expectation is that if we do good, then by doing good, we will be elevated in life. We will excel in life. We have this idea that doing what is right and laboring for the sake of others by its nature will mean that we will excel. But that's not always the case. Often doing good and laboring for the sake of others is draining and discouraging. And the temptation then is to give up, to stop. Nearly 500 years ago, the reformer John Calvin expressed this truth in his commentary saying this, well-doing does not simply mean doing our duty, but the performance of acts of kindness and has a reference to men. We are instructed not to be weary in assisting our neighbors in performing good offices and exercising generosity. This precept is highly necessary for we are naturally reluctant to discharge the duties of brotherly love and many unpleasant occurrences arise by the order of the best disposed persons is apt to be cooled. We meet with many unworthy and many ungrateful persons. The vast number of necessities cases overwhelm us and the applications which crowd upon us from every quarter exhaust our patience. Our warmth is abated by the coolness of other men. In short, the world presents innumerable hindrances, which tend to lead us aside from the right path. So, the temptation for you and me is to grow weary in doing good. Our inclination, if left to ourselves, is to become cold-hearted, to lose our energy, and to lose our resolve. Perhaps this morning, this is how you feel. You feel like Asaph. You feel like Solomon. You feel discouraged, and you feel defeated. You try to live the Christian life, but it seems like the only thing you're reaping from this is hardship. Sure, there are some joys along the way, but mixed with those joys are the constant barrage of conflict with friends and family. And then you throw in all of the internal whisperings of shame, and the result is you are left barely hanging on. 
And in that state, as we're hanging on by a thread, as we're about to give up, as we're about to lose heart, Paul tells us, don't give up. Don't grow weary in doing good. Don't lose heart. Well, how are we to not lose heart? How are we not to give up? Well, this is where Paul takes us next in verse 9 to this idea of endurance. Look at the second part of verse 9. He tells us why. Why we, you and I should not give up. Why you and I should not lose heart. Look in your Bibles at the end of verse 9 here. Here's why. For in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. Once more, Paul returns to the language of sowing and reaping. In verses 7 through 8, Paul stated the truth that what we sow, we will reap. If we sow righteousness, we reap righteousness if we, and happiness. If we sow lawlessness, we reap destruction and heartache. And now here in verse 9, Paul is saying that if we endure, if we don't give up, here is God's promise for you. You will reap. You will bear fruit. You just have to hold on. You just have to not give up. Ekuloil is the word, which means to become weary or to give out. It's the same word used in Matthew 15, 32, where Jesus is looking on the crowds and he says, I have to feed them lest they ekluo, lest they faint on the way. So Paul here is calling us to endurance. He's calling us to perseverance. He's telling us to hold on and to hang on, to endure, to persevere, to not give up. You may be feeling weary and exhausted and defeated and discouraged, hanging on, and Paul says, just hang on longer. Don't let go. Don't give up because you will reap if you stay with it. He's calling us to endurance and perseverance. He's telling us to hold on and to hang on. And when we read the Bible, there are different ways that we can endure, different ways that we can persevere. The Bible talks about us enduring in our salvation. The teaching of Scripture is that you and I are to endure, to, to persevere in our salvation. Listen to what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 24, verse 9 through 13. He says this, they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And all of those disciples, with the exception of John, met a martyr's end. And John was, according to church tradition, boiled alive in oil that he survived. So I, I, I don't know if it's even worth surviving at that point. Jesus continues, and, and many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. In Hebrews 3.14, we read this, for we have come to share in Christ if we indeed hold our original confidence firm to the end. So we're to persevere in our faith. Despite obstacles, despite trials, despite tribulations, despite our life being endangered potentially, we are to persevere. Why? Why? Because that perseverance in our salvation is an indication that we are actually saved. Do you see that? Those who are truly saved will persevere. They will endure. And if you don't persevere and you fall away, that is an indication you were never saved to begin with. And John makes that clear. They went out from us because they were never truly part of us. For if they were of us, they would not have gone out from us, is what he says in 1 John. But understand this, because some of you might have felt anxiety at the thought of falling away because you have friends and family who have, in fact, fallen away. But understand this, that perseverance in the faith, the idea that genuine Christians never fall away, that's not just a command 
It is a gospel guarantee. It's guaranteed because if you're a Christian, you didn't choose to be saved to begin with. The the clear teaching of the Bible is that God chose you and God saved you. And because he chose you and saved you, he will glorify you. Matthew 8, 29 through 30, those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. That, that is what William, the, the Puritan William Perkins called the golden chain of redemption. Predestination, well, foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, glorification. You will persevere in your faith if you are a true Christian, because you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. In him also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Listen to this. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. If you are a believer, you will persevere. You will endure. You'll never fall away because the Holy Spirit lives within you and he it seals you. And that seal will stay until you acquire possession of your future inheritance. If you are a Christian, you are guaranteed to persevere because right now you are held by Christ. John 10, 27 through 30, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I am and the Father are one. There in that rich text, you have the truth of election, God's choosing of us. He has chosen a people, the Father, that he gives to the Son, and the Son holds on to them. They're in his hand, and no one snatches them out. So because you are held in Christ's hand, he will never let you go. My brothers and sisters, this is great assurance. Christ will never let you go. You cannot lose your salvation. Rest in this assurance. When that is clear in your mind, then you have the ability to endure and persevere. I once preached a sermon in a church on this text that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. And I waxed eloquently on this truth of the perseverance of the saints, that those who are truly saved will endure. And after the sermon, a lady came up to me. She had been going to this church for about 15 years. She was in tears. And she told me, I have never in this church heard what you taught this morning. The pastor's philosophy is agree to disagree. And on this situation, some are Pentecostal, some are Baptist. So instead of coming down on a side, we're just going to stay in the narrow. And in tears, she told me, I have never heard it preached that if I'm saved, I will persevere. And I thought to myself, that is pastoral mispractice. Because how on earth Can you as a pastor preach a text that so clearly says that you're going to persevere and withhold from your people the biblical bedrock truth that they are supposed to stand on? I mean, that's what you stand on. That's how you endure. It's knowing I'm going to continue to the end because I am sealed by the Spirit. I'm elect of the Father and I am held in the hand of the Son. My salvation is guaranteed by the triune God. And so you persevere. You don't fall away because you can't fall away. So don't give up. Your emotions are shifting. They make you feel distant from the Father. But understand that the Father has given you to the Son. And right now, the Son holds you in his hand 
and you are sealed by the Spirit. Don't listen to your emotions. Tell yourself truth. Endure. Don't lose heart. But not only do we persevere in our own salvation, we endure in the hope of salvation for our loved ones. Many Christians have friends and family that they desperately want to come to faith in Christ. It's their heart's ultimate longing. It's what they go to sleep thinking about. It's what they wake up contemplating. And there are many Christians right now, perhaps this is you, living in heartache because their kids or their parents or their cousins hate Jesus. Or arguably, even worse, are completely indifferent to Jesus, unmoved by Jesus. Christian, if that's you, don't lose heart. Don't go weary. Don't give up hope. Keep praying. Keep witnessing. Keep trusting. Because you don't know what your powerful God in his sovereign grace will bring about. The classic example of this principle in our Bibles is that of Nicodemus. When we first meet Nicodemus, he comes to Jesus at night because he's afraid. And in his conversation with Jesus, we see the topic of salvation discussed. Jesus tells him he must be born again. He responds back with sarcasm, asking Jesus if he needs to crawl back into his mom and come out. Jesus then doubles down and tells him he must be born by the Spirit because it doesn't matter what his works are. They're just fleshly works. What is required is spiritual birth. And Nicodemus is repulsed by this because Jesus is assaulting his works, righteousness, religion. Nicodemus thought that he could go to heaven by his obedience to the law. And Jesus makes clear to him that you can't do anything to go to heaven. You must be born by the Spirit. There's nothing that you can do. And as the account ends in John 3, we're left with no resolution at all. And as readers, we think that Nicodemus leaves and remains for the rest of his days as an unbeliever. But his story isn't complete. Because later on in the Gospel of John, we see Nicodemus publicly defending Jesus to his peers, the same peers that end up murdering Jesus. And at the end of the Gospel of John, when his disciples have abandoned him, it is Nicodemus who is going to Pilate and asking for the body of Jesus it is Nicodemus who is helping to care for the body of our Lord. Something had changed. Because Nicodemus is now at the end of, the, at the end of John's gospel willing to put his neck on the line. Well, what, what had changed? He'd become a Christian. That's what had changed. The one who had at one time resisted Jesus and was sarcastic with Jesus now rested in Jesus and served Jesus the great Anglican Bishop J.C. Ryle articulates the truth, writing this, the history of Nicodemus is meant to teach us that we should never despise the day of small things in religion. We must not set down a man as having no grace because his first steps towards God are timid and wavering, and the first movements of his soul are uncertain, hesitating, and stamped with much imperfection. We must remember our Lord's reception of Nicodemus. He did not break the bruised reed or quench the smoking flax, which he saw before him. Like him, let us take inquirers by the hand and deal with them gently and lovingly. In everything, there must be a beginning. It is not those who make the most flaming profession of religion at first, who endure the longest or prove the most steadfast. Judas Iscariot was an apostle when Nicodemus was just groping his way slowly into full light. Yet afterwards, when Nicodemus was boldly helping to bury his crucified Savior, Judas Iscariot had betrayed him and hanged himself. This is a fact which ought not be forgotten. And so Christian, keep witnessing to your friends and family. Keep praying. Endure. Do not lose heart. So we are to endure in our salvation and endure in the hope of salvation for others. But the Bible also teaches that we're to endure in our sanctification and our becoming more holy and our becoming more like Jesus. It's so easy to grow discouraged in our walk with God. 
Those same sins seem to creep up on us and we give way again and again. Our thoughts and our tongues and our actions, we we hate what we do. We're like Paul in Romans 7, doing the things we hate and the things that we love are the things that we don't do. And like Paul at the end of Romans 7, we, we express disgust with ourselves. Oh, wretched man that I am. But like Paul, while we feel wretched and disgusted with ourselves, we must be determined to keep going. We must keep on pursuing Jesus. Listen to Paul's passion that he expressed to the Philippians in Philippians 3, 8 through 14. The same man who in Romans 7 says, wretched man that I am, who will, who will rid me from this body of death in Philippians 3, this is what he says. I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may, be, may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through the faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. While Paul struggled with sin and while Paul at times despised himself, Paul kept his eyes fixed on Christ. I'm straining, I'm pressing forward, Paul says, so that way I might gain him, so that way I might know him. So if you're discouraged right now by your own battle with sin and your own lack of holiness and your own failure to live up to Christ's likeness, don't give up. Keep fighting. Keep killing the sin in your life. Keep pursuing Jesus because you will one day harvest. You will one day reap. So we endure in our salvation. We endure in our sanctification and we endure in ministry. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul expresses some real discouragement in ministry. In verse one and two of, in verse one rather of of 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says, having this ministry by mercy, we do not lose heart. Why does Paul even bring that up? He brings that up because if you're in ministry, you're inclined to lose heart. And Paul says, when I remember that I'm in ministry by God's mercy, I don't lose heart. Because remember Paul's story. This is a man who once persecuted Christians. This is a man who once arrested them so they would be executed. That's Paul. And Paul says, I don't lose heart in ministry. And the reason why I don't lose heart, because I remember that doing ministry is God's mercy. Is it hard? Is it horrible? Yes, at times. But it is God's mercy that I can do this. And then in Verse two through six, Paul talks about how, how he doesn't do ministry the wrong way, like so many who are, who are peddling the word of God, who are in ministry for the wrong reasons. Then in verse five, he states his integrity in ministry and, and his goal of ministry and who he's looking at in ministry. In verse five of 2 Corinthians four, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. And then in verses 8 through 12, he expresses the real affliction he has in ministry. Listen as I read. Paul says in verse 8, 2 Corinthians 4, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in in our bodies. Paul says, listen to these words again, afflicted, perplexed, persecuted, struck down, and carrying death. 
that's what ministry was for Paul. This is what pastoral ministry looks like. Now, I'm not talking about those pastors who don't pastor. Those individuals who call pastoral ministry preaching a sermon on Sunday and calling it a week. No, no, no. I'm I'm talking about real pastors, real shepherds. Those who, like Richard Baxter said, have the smell of the sheep on them. They're meeting with their church people. They're having their church people like into their homes to eat. They're, they're, They're crying with their church people and laughing with their people. That's what we're talking about. And when you're pastoring like that, your heart will be broken. It will. When you are investing in other Christians like that, they are going to let you down just like you let others down. It hurts to do ministry. This is what true ministry is. And we have to ask, why does it have to be this way? Why do we suffer? Why do we grow tired? Well, in ministry, you suffer and grow tired because you're doing ministry to suffering and tired people. Sympathy is crucial in ministry. Michael Reeves writes this, weary pastor, God could have used angels to preach the gospel. He chose the weak who can sympathize with the weak. Now understand, it's not just pastoring that this takes place. All of us are called to ministry. Remember, according to Ephesians 4, which we looked at a couple weeks ago, the pastor's job is not primarily to do the work of the ministry. The pastor's job is to equip the saints. And the saints, according to Ephesians 4, they're the ones who do the work of ministry. And many of you have suffered tremendously and you're asking God, why would you, God, allow this pain into my life? Why would you let me suffer like this? Here's why. You are in pain and suffering the life that you lived so that you can sympathize and minister to those who are in pain and suffering like you have. When you've suffered like them, you're going to be able to to minister to them in a way that I never have in a way that no one else ever has. If you've lost a child, I can give you the word. I can share with you scripture. I can pray with you. But that's about it. I I can't experience, I don't know what you're experiencing, right? Why? I I don't have kids. I've never had a kid die. How, How would I know what that feels like? But there is a unique ministry. When you come across another saint, who has lost a child. And they're able to do gospel ministry to you in a way that I can't. And so you suffer so that you can serve. So hold on. Don't be discouraged. And as you do ministry, and as you serve other believers, and as you pour your life into them, you may notice a strange thing. A lot of times, it feels like you're wasting your time. You invest, you spend, you pour your emotional energy into others, and they walk away. And all of it feels like a total waste. Even so, we must endure and then hang on. One of my heroes of the faith is John Wesley. Wesley was a preacher and a theologian. His evangelistic ministry led to the birth of Methodism, which, you know, a couple hundred years ago was really strong. He was a huge influence in the ending of slave trade in England. I don't know if you knew that. He and his brother Charles did profound ministry and some of the greatest sermons we read today and some of the greatest hymns that we sing today come from the Wesleys. In my opinion, Charles Wesley is the greatest hymn writer. But all throughout Wesley's ministry, especially early on, early on you, you don't see triumph and victory. You see rejection and discouragement. When you read through John Wesley's journals, you'll be surprised. Uh, May of 1738 was particularly rough for Wesley. And and, and I want want to read to you several excerpts from his his journal because you you think like these heroes of the faith, like they were always like successful. But, But listen to this. This is coming from Sunday, May 7th. Wesley writes, I preached at St. Lawrence in the morning and afterwards at St. Catherine Cree's church. I was enabled to speak with strong words at both. He said, man, I, I preach a good sermon. He says, and I was therefore the less surprised at being informed 
I was not to preach anymore in any of those churches. Two days later, on May 9th, Wesley reads this. I preached at Great St. Helens to a very num numerous congregation on he that spareth not his own son, but delivers him up for us all. How shall we not also with him also freely give us all things? My heart was so enlarged to declare the love of God to all who were oppressed by the devil that I did not wonder at the least when I was afterwards told, sir, you must preach here no more. That next Sunday, May 14th, Wesley writes, I preached in the morning at St. Anne's Aldersgate and in the afternoon at the Savoy Chapel, free salvation by faith in the blood of Christ. I was quickly apprised that at St. Anne's likewise, I am to preach no more. Five days later, Friday, May 19th, Wesley in his journal writes this, I preached at St. John's, Wapping at three and at St. Bennett's, Paul's Wharf in the evening. At these churches, likewise, I am to preach no more. On the 21st of May, Wesley preached at three churches and was told by all three that he wasn't welcome back. And after weeks of deflation and rejection, Wesley goes full emo in his journal. He writes this, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I had continual sorrow and heaviness in my heart. Oh, why is it that so great, so wise, so holy God will use such an instrument as me? Lord, let the dead bury their dead. But wilt thou send the dead to raise the dead? Yea, thou sendest whom thou wilt, and slowest mercy by whom thou wilt show mercy. Amen. But then according to thy will, if thou speak the word, Judas shall cast out devils. That's discouragement. Wesley says, if you want to raise the dead by the dead, I guess you're going to have to do that. If you want to cast out devils by Judas, he's referring to himself, that's what you must do. Then we read this on Sunday the 28th, the next week. I waked in peace, but not in joy. In the same even quiet state I was till evening, when I was roughly attacked by a large company as an enthusiast, a seducer, a setter forth of new doctrine, by the blessing of God I was not moved to anger, but after a calm and short reply, went away. Though not with so tender a concern as was due to those who were seeking death in the air of life, this day I preached in the morning at St. George, Bloomberry, this victory that overcometh the world, even our faith, and in the afternoon at the chapel in the Long Acre on God's justifying the ungodly. <laughs> the last time I am to understand, I am to preach at either. So here again, he, he's, he's sorrowful, he preaches again, and he's told, you're not welcome here anymore. But notice this time in his journal, he says, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And as you continue reading Wesley's journal, for the next year, you find more rejection and his lamenting his rejection. But by the spring of 1739, things begin to change. He talks about meeting George Whitfield and George Whitfield's strange practice of preaching in the fields. Wesley was accustomed to preaching in the churches. And in his journal, he says, he thought it almost a sin that you could be saved outside of a church. Like, why would I preach in a field? That doesn't make sense. Preaching is the business of the church. But at any rate, Wesley is, is encouraged by what Whitfield does, and Wesley starts preaching in the fields, preaching on hills, preaching underneath a tree. It doesn't matter. And on April, not, April 2nd of the next year, we read this. At four in the afternoon, I love this. Listen to this. I submitted to the more vile. What, what's that? Look what he says. Proclaiming in the highways the glad tidings of salvation, speaking from a little eminence in the ground adjoining to the city to about 3,000 people. The scripture on which I spoke was this, and then he, in parentheses, writes, is it possible anyone should be ignorant that is fulfilled in every ministry of, the, of Christ? The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Just six days later on April 8th, we read this. 
At seven in the morning, I preached to about a thousand persons at Bristol and afterwards to about 1,500 on the top of the Hannah Mountain Kingswood. I called to them in the words of the evangelical prophet, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, come and buy wine without money, without price. About 5,000 were in the afternoon at the Rose Green on the other side of Kingswood, among whom I stood and cried in the name of the Lord. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. What a difference a year could make in the life of Wesley. Had he listened to his own insecurities, remember he referenced himself as dead and as a Judas, If he had given way to a weary heart, if he had given up, he would have never reaped the crop that God had ordained. By God's grace, Wesley endured and preached on, and through him and through his ministry, God brought thousands upon thousands to Christ. And Wesley's ministry would continue to be a bag of both rejection and acceptance. And and later on, in a couple of years, he would even be dragged through the streets because a riot would break out. But in it all, what had changed in Wesley was he kept his eyes not on his situation, but on Christ. Good or bad, nobody's showing up and I get thrown out of a church or 1,500 people on a hill. It doesn't matter. The results don't matter because I'm keeping my eyes fixed on Christ. And that's the key. And this is where we're getting at in our call to endurance here. What is it that keeps us from losing heart? What is it that keeps us from growing weary in doing good? The secret is keeping our eyes fixed, not on situation, but on the Savior. Not on circumstance, but on Christ. Another hero of church history and another personal hero of mine is the Puritan John Owen. And if you know anything about Owen, you know that he was a giant. He was one of the greatest theologians that that ever lived, and that's not an exaggeration. His collected works fill volumes, and they are as doxological as they are doctrinal. Uh, You have been shaped by Owen, whether you know it or not, because your pastor has been shaped by Owen. But Owen was not just a man who thought deeply about God. He was a man who felt strongly for God. And he was a man who labored his entire life for God. And he was a man who lost everything in his service to God. He is someone who could have easily have lost heart. This was a man plagued by poor poor health. This was a man persecuted by the government. And this was the man who was persistent in grief. He had 11 children and all of them died. His wife also died. And we have to ask, what kept a man like John Owen, a pastor and a theologian, a child and a servant of God, a laborer of the Lord, what kept a man who lost everything from giving up, from growing weary and doing good? How does he not lose heart? After his 10th child died, here is what he wrote. A due contemplation of the glory of Christ will restore and compose the mind. Will lift the minds and hearts of believers above all the troubles of this life and is the sovereign antidote that will expel all the poison that is in them and otherwise might perplex and enslave their, slo- their souls. So what was the secret to not losing heart for Owen, a man who lost his wife and all of his kids, who was kicked out of the ministry, who was persecuted by the government, who had personal health issues? What kept him going? The glory of Jesus, beholding Christ. Owen further describes what the glory of Jesus does. He says, Do any of us find decays and grace prevailing on us? Deadness, coldness, lukewarmness, a kind of spiritual stupidity and senselessness coming upon us. Let us assure ourselves that there is no better way for our healing and our deliverance, yea, no other way but this alone. 
namely the obtaining a fresh view of the glory of Christ by faith and a steady abiding therein. Constant contemplation of Christ and his glory, putting forth its transforming power unto the reveal of all grace is the only relief in this case. How did Owen persevere when he lost everything? When he was like a modern day Job? He persevered because he kept his eyes fixed on Jesus. Because he continued to behold his Savior. Earlier, we referenced 2 Corinthians 4, where Paul listed all the horrible things in ministry, all of his sufferings. And at the end of that text, in verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says, we do not lose heart. Listen to this. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Though Paul felt himself losing heart and losing hope, though he described himself literally as wasting away physically and emotionally, he affirmed that he daily renewed himself internally. How? Like Wesley and like Owen, Paul beheld Christ. He was obsessed with the glory of Jesus. He kept his eyes fixed on Christ. And as you behold Christ, you become like Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.18, we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So how are you and I to endure? How are you and I to not lose heart? How are we to not give up? We don't lose heart. We don't give up. We endure and persevere because we keep our eyes fixed on Christ. Because we are enamored with the glory of Jesus, who he is, what he taught, what he does. You, you live in reality of your union and communion with him. How do you do that? Read your Bible every day. Pray every day. Be committed to the church. These are the ways that you see Jesus, hear Jesus, experience Jesus. And as you behold Jesus, you become like Jesus. And it's not just this beholding of Christ. It is this reality that we are united to Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, as Paul is celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, he says that death is swallowed up in victory and that the sting of death is gone and that you and I have victory. And in verse 57, he says, thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, that knowing in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Well, how is it that death has no sting? How is it that death has no victory? Death has no sting and death has no victory because we are united to Jesus so that his death becomes our death and his resurrection to life becomes our resurrection to life. Because we're united to him, we have hope, we have peace, we have endurance. Though we're rotting away, we can daily be refreshed in him. Though the world assaults us, we're hidden in him. He is our strength and in him we triumph. To all weary followers, to all weary disciples, to all tottering on the edge, to those who are growing weary and doing good, to those who are losing heart, to you and me, listen now to Jesus' words of promise and comfort. John 16, 33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. 
but take heart. I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Father, this morning we have seen so clearly from your word the need for us not to lose hope, not to lose heart, but to endure. Father, this morning so many of us are worn down and weary and tired and we feel like giving up. Seems like we can't conquer our sin. It seems like our friends and family will never come to faith. It seems like we feel so distant from you. It feels like when we do ministry, it's just a total waste of time. But Father, we know that if we continue, if we hold on to Christ, if we endure, if we persevere, we will reap. Not because of us, but because you in sovereign grace ordain and bring about your purposes and your plans. So Father, as we are living through all of the trials and circumstances of life, help us to keep our eyes fixed on Christ, our Savior. Father, encourage your people this morning to endure and persevere because we are held by you and united to your Son. And as we behold him, we become like him. Christ's name I pray, amen.